السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته نحمده ونسلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمد عليهم غير المغذوب عليهم ولا الدعاء آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وصحبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله As we all know, you know, today is Jummah to the or the farewell Jummah of this Ramadan So, you know, Ramadan's come and Ramadan's almost gone uh, So Eid will either be Wednesday or Thursday depending on the sighting of the moon You know, as we all also know, you know, the purpose of fasting isn't to stay hungry and thirsty. Just like, you know, when, when an athlete is doing certain exercises, that's not the goal is to do those exercises. It's what he's going to do with those exercises. That's, that's the goal. So staying hungry and thirsty is an exercise, but the goal is something different. You know, just like, again, you know, when an athlete's running through tires, well, that's not what they do on the field. You know, but it's teaching him certain things, or creating certain memories within his muscles. The hunger and the thirst, you know, should create within us certain thought processes. You know, it should make our, our mind move in a certain direction. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly in the, or, or various places in the Qur'an is reminding us to ponder over everything. You know, even to the extent where he says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَّبَّرُونَ Quran," That do you not ponder over the Qur'an. I mean, you know, the Qur'an is the book, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدَلِّ الْمُتَّقِينَ You know, this is the book in which there is no doubt. And his guidance for you know, the muttaqi, those who have taqwa. So the guidance is only for those who have taqwa. You know, it's not guidance for everybody. You know, that's why also he, he mentions that there are some who, who, who are misguided by it. Because their hearts are diseased, they don't want guidance, so Allah gives them whatever they want. He's, in not, he's not in need of any of us. We need him. So, if we are commanded to ponder over a book in which there is no doubt, this is the, this is the word of Allah, then how much more should I ponder over everything else? But the biggest question is, where should that pondering take me? Is again, hudallil muttaqeen, guidance for those who are, those who have taqwa, those who are muttaqeen. And the purpose of Ramadan, the purpose of staying hungry and thirsty, <coughs> is the same thing, is to attain taqwa. And as we mentioned over and over, the definition of taqwa that Allah SWT himself gives in the Quran. You know, and not just any taqwa, but the taqwa of the heart is to humble yourself before the messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That those who lower their voice before the messenger, meaning that they humble themselves before him, 
Those are the ones whose hearts are tested for taqwa. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has certified that these are the people of taqwa. So this is the whole purpose of Ramadan. And he has placed within a Ramadan so many lights to guide us. You know, he's decorated the whole month with lights upon lights. And as we started talking about last week, one of those lights is the Battle of Badr, which took place on the 17th of Ramadan. And I want to continue with this today, inshallah. And then that will lead me into one of the other lights. As we mentioned last week, you know, the Rasulullah Sassam sets out for the caravan, you know, with the companions, 313 companions. All of these companions are thinking, oh, we're going to go and raid this caravan that's getting ready to, to make war, or getting, getting Quraysh ready to make war upon us. He sets out, the caravan sends word to Quraysh, and Quraysh sends the army. So all of this is right in the middle of Ramadan. So again, if he had wanted to, he could have delayed this. Said, now nah, we'll let them go and we'll get the next one. <coughs> On the way, you know, when, when the Muslims realize that, oh, Quraysh has sent an army. So now Rasulullah Sussan stops that night and he consults with them. He asked them what their opinion is. Do we continue or do we go back? He's not consulting with them because he doesn't know. He knows what he needs to do. And he knows what the will of Allah is. Because he also tells them that Allah subhanahu wa has promised one of the two. Either the caravan or the army. And of course he himself is the explanation to the Quran. So he also knows which one of the two. But he wants to show us their attitude. The attitude of the true believers. And what their purpose in life was. So that night, you know, now because initially when all these 313 men had come out, the whole thing was, oh, we're going to go and raid the caravan. Wasn't expected to have, you know, any significant losses. Now you're going to face an army that's three times your size and well equipped. The Muslims, all they had were seven and a half swords. They had eight swords. One of them was broken in half. A few horses, a few camels. Some of them had some spears. And that was it. Whereas Quraysh, you know, they had one uh, soldier who had to tow armor. Sword in one hand, spear in the other. And the dagger he didn't know what to do with, so he stuck it, you know, in his helmet. So he asked them, he said, what do you, what should we do? So the first to stand up is Abu Bakr. And he said, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let's move forward, we'll do whatever. You want, you know, if you want to go forward, we're with you. Uh, Rasulullah thanks him for his words, and he asks him, what do you think, what should we do? Omar Radion stands up, says the same thing, more or less. And so, same thing. Rasulullah thanks him for his words, he sits down, he asks again, now Miqdad bin Amr, Radion, he stands up. He says, Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu You do whatever you think is best. We are not like the children of Israel who said to Musa al-Islam that you and your Lord go and fight and we're going to sit back and watch. But what we say to you is you and your Lord go and fight and we will fight alongside with you. And, by, and I swear by him who has sent you with the, mes sent you with the message of truth that even if you lead us to Barq al ghimad you know, we will march with you and fight anyone who comes in your way. You know, Barq al-Ghimad is a place down in Yemen. 
So, you know, even if we got to go to the corner of, of Arabia, all the way to the other end, you know, we're willing to do this. And remember this, the wording here. Rasulullah so thanks him, he sits down, and again he asks. And now, Sa'ad bin Mu'adr understood why he was asking. The previous three are all Muhajirin. They're all who, those who had emigrated with the Rasulullah Sassim from Mecca to Medina. They were with him to the end, no matter what. The Ansar, the agreement with the Ansar was that they would protect him once he came to their city. And once he was in the city. The official agreement didn't stipulate what happens when he's outside of the city. So, you know, they could have found a loophole and said, oh, you know, we're not duty-bound to any of this. Sa'ad bin Ma'ad, he's one of the leaders of Ansar. He's actually one of the main leaders of Aus. You know, if you remember, two main clans or two, two main Arab tribes in Medina, Khazraj and Aus. You know, Khazraj was the larger tribe, and the great-grandmother of Rasulullah was from Khazraj, from Banu Najjar the mother of Hazrat Abdul Muttalib radiallahu Sa'ad bin Mu'ad was from Aus and he was such, he was very young and very charismatic. And the way he became Muslim was that when Rasulullah so some year before immigration had sent Masab bin Umar radiallahu to, to Medina to start preaching, you know, he didn't even want to see him. They pulled a trick on him and forced him into this encounter. And then when he realized that all this propaganda was nonsense, and this is really the truth, he accepts Islam and then he goes back to his people and he tells them that, that if, you know, I will not speak to you unless you become Muslim. And by the end of the day, the whole clan was Muslim. And so he stands up and he says, Ya Rasulullah Sassam, you mean us? You want to know what we say? And Rasulullah Sassim smiled and said, yes. And so he addresses him. And he says, Ya Rasulullah Sassim, we have declared our faith in you. So we have declared our faith in you. And we have accepted your message as the message of truth. And we have taken firm vows that we will do whatever you tell us to do. So do whatever, what, do as you wish, and we are with you. By him who has sent you with the message of truth. Even if you lead us into the sea, we will ride along with you. We have no qualms or no hesitation in meeting the enemy tomorrow in the battlefield. And we fight hard and with determination when war breaks out. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to show us what will please you. So go ahead with Allah's blessing. Now if you start analyzing this, these statements, of course, you know, Miqdad bin Amr, he said, you know, even if you go to Barqal, Rimad. And the thing is, if you march on land and into battle, there's that possibility, you know, that you'll be killed, but then there's also that possibility that you will be, be victorious. Here, Sa'ad bin Mu'adran says, even if you take us into the sea, we will ride along with you. You know, riding into the sea, you're not coming back. There's no other outcome except death. In a way, he's saying that we will not be like Jibreel al-Islam who left you at Sidrat al-Muntah. 
Because that's why he left him. He said, you know, if I go forward, you know, I'll be annihilated. He says, we will, we will go wherever you go. We will not leave your side. You tell us what to do and we will do it. Without any hesitation. And we do all of this for your pleasure. As he says, we pray that Allah allow us to show you what will please you. This is the understanding of the companions of Rasulullah They understood that success, that success in this world and the next was dependent on the pleasure of Rasulullah. You know, when the armies finally met that day, you know, Sa'ad bin Mu'adir, he comes to Rasulullah again. He says, Ya Rasulullah, let us make a tent for you in the back and have a horse ready for you. You know, if the outcome is as we wish, then Alhamdulillah. But if it goes the other way, then you take the horse and you ride back to our people. Because we have left many people in, in Medina who, who love you as we love you. Who will protect you and give you good counsel and, and who will fight your enemies for you. And if they had known that we were going to war, they would have not stayed behind. But again, your honor, your protection, your pleasure, this is all that mattered to them. They didn't care about their own honor or their own lives or anything else. Their whole focus was the protection and the honor of Rasulullah. <laughs> And his pleasure. This is also why, you know, that first, you know, when, when the Battle of Badr started, you know, from the Quraysh side, you had Utbah Shaiba, his brother Shaiba, and, uh, and his son Walid. Well seasoned warriors. You know, Walid had fought in 23 battles before Badr, victorious in all of them. So they came out and they challenged, oh, you know, who wants to fight us? Three of the Ansar immediately run out. And then when he asks, he says, who are you? And they say, oh, you know. He's, then he calls out to Rasulullah and he says, Ya Rasulullah. No, he doesn't say Ya Rasulullah. He says, oh, Muhammad. You know, send us our equals. We don't want to fight these. And we're Quraysh. You know, in modern day language, we are the top dogs here. And literally, that's what they were. You know, challenging Rasulullah Sallallahu So now Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi what does he do? He calls them back. He is pleased with them. <coughs> and then he says, Ya Ali! <laughs> Hamza! Ubaidah ibn Harif! He was also the cousin of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi He is the son of, the oldest son of Abdul Muttalib. Harith bin Abdul Muttalib was his, the oldest son of Hazrat Abdul Muttalib. So he calls them the three. Three from his own household. He says, go. They line up, match up. Hamza against Utba. Ubaidullah against Shaiba. And Ali against Walid. Ali, of course, you know, if you read his description, he was not a tall man. He was actually a short man. Well built, but short. <coughs> Hamza Radio immediately dispatches Utbah as soon as the fighting starts. Ali Radio dispatches Walid in two pieces. <coughs> and Shaiba and Ubaidullah strike each other at the same time. Ali Radun finishes off Shaiba, picks up Ubaidullah, brings him to Rasulullah, lays his head on the thigh, the blessed thigh of Rasulullah, and then Ubaidullah he says, 
you know. He asked him, he says that, that uh, perhaps Abu Talib, because Hazrat Abu Talib used to say a poem that we will not give up Rasulullah until we have given up, up our lives and our children. <coughs> he says perhaps he, you know, his poem was referring to me. And he asked him, he says, am I among the martyrs? And Rasulullah says, yes. And then he right there in that position, that honorable position of having his head on the honorable thigh of Rasulullah so some he passes. Subhanallah. But of the 70 of Quraysh that were killed in this battle, you know, because you have to remember you have 313 soldiers, 5,000 angels that are sent. 70 of the Quraysh were killed, 70 of them were taken prisoner. Of the 70 that were killed, 36 of them were killed by Sayyidina Ali radiallahu alone. Another 13 he helped in. Which makes what? 49. Which leaves how many? 21. 21 for all the th other 312 soldiers and 5,000 angels. And there were a few that were killed by the angels and they could tell their marks because as their heads came off, they were cauterized. <coughs> That's how they knew uh, this was killed by an angel. <coughs> so there's no blood. It's just... And the reason I'm talking about Ali, of course, is Ali is Ali. But the 21st of this month was when he was... Martyr. Nineteenth was the attack. The twenty-first of Ramadan is when he passed from the attack. Again, another light decorating this month for our guidance. But we have to take the lessons from that. But this is also why, when we look at this, uh, is you also have to understand for ninety years, part of the Juma Khutbah, a mandatory part of the Juma Khutbah was to curse Ali During the reign of Banu Umayyah, this was mandatory. If an Imam did not do it, he was either removed from his position, and many of them were also killed if they refused. The propaganda was so deep. Umar bin Abdul Aziz, he's from Banu Umayyah. He's the exception to the rule. When he was a young boy, his father sent him to study under Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah ibn Uthbah ibn Masood. So this is the grand nephew of Abdullah ibn Masood. Abdullah ibn Masood is, is second among the companions of Rasulullah Sallam as far as the knowledge of fiqh. Second to who? To Ali. He's third among the knowledge of the recitation of the Qur'an, because he's, he, he learned 70 surahs of the Qur'an directly from Rasulullah The remaining 44 he learned from Ali. Of course, number one in that category also is Ali. So, he was learning with him, and then one day, somehow, the topic of Ali Radham came up. And Umar bin Abdul Aziz, young boy, having listened to all the propaganda, and of course every Juma khutbah he goes, you know, they're cursing Ali. So, he basically regurgitates all this propaganda. And Ubaidullah ibn Abdullah, who is among the fuqaha of, of Medina Munawwara. There were seven well-known fuqaha of Medina Munawwara among the Tabi. So he's one of them. So when he hears this, he says to Umar bin Abdul Aziz, he says, has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala become upset with the companions of Badr? You know, because they all knew the hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu said that, that, you know, for, as far as the companions of Badr, they can do whatever they want. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven them. Of course, their love for Rasulullah sallallahu drove them to do what? What pleased the Rasulullah sallallahu so they knew this. 
So when, again, Ubaidullah, he says, has Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala become upset with the companions of Badr? And Umar bin Abdul Aziz in astonishment says, was Ali in Badr? I mean, the, again, the propaganda being so deep, you know, is as if they had removed his name from the companions of Badr. If we look at when Ali Radu is martyred, of course, again, he's attacked on the 19th, but what is he doing at that time? He's getting an army ready to go and deal with Sham in the middle of the Ramadan. You know, again, Ramadan isn't a month that we all, you know, we're fasting so we don't do anything. And when it comes to the honor of Rasulullah if we don't do anything, then our Iman, there is no Iman. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need us to do anything. And he says that clearly in the Quran. In Surah Tawbah, he mentioned that, look, you know, if you don't defend him, then I have many soldiers who will defend him. You know, we see what happened in the cave. When he was in the cave with Abu Bakr, who did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send to defend him? A pigeon and a spider. Allah's army has no shortage. And he uses his own enemies to fight his own other enemies. Like when he sent uh, the people of Babylon to go and deal with Bani Israel when they were causing th uh, mischief in the earth the first time. And he refers to the army of the Babylonians who were, who were polytheist as his own army. You know, it's interesting. Last few minutes here. You know, Abu Lahab, the uncle of Rasulullah Sallallahu for whom Rasulullah Allah Subhanahu Wa reveals Surah Lahab because he opposed his, his nephew, tried to degrade his nephew, who is the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah he reveals that, you know, about Abu Lahab, what his end will be. But he died in this world, you know, after the Battle of Badr. When the news came to Mecca that, the, that Quraysh had lost, and a, and a significant loss, and all of these leaders had been killed. The slave of, 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 the, of Abbas, who was Muslim, out of joy started dancing and, and, and celebrating. And so he comes and he starts beating him. So the wife of Abbas, she, she picks up a stone and whacks him across the head. Then a few days later, he died. So from a medical standpoint, I know, okay, it was a subdural hematoma. He bled in there, a slow bleed, and he just, he died. People then, what did they think when he died? They said, oh, he's died from a certain disease that they, they wouldn't even go close. His sons wouldn't even go close to his body to bury him. After the body started stinking, and the neighbors were complaining, and they forced the sons to bury him. How did they bury him? They threw stones on him from a distance to cover him up. That's his, his punishment in this world, challenging the honor of Rasulullah. And this isn't a distant um, example. You know, we think, oh, this happened back then. Recently, you know, there's a news anchor in India, like one of their top anchors. He just died, young guy. You know, who, who used to, on, on live TV, challenge the honor of Rasulullah Sallam, challenge the honor of the daughter of Rasulullah Sallam. How did he die? COVID. And he died that no one would even go close to him. He's begging that the doctors come and see him and nobody comes even close. Not even his family is coming close to him. Just like Abu Lahab. 
Okay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't need any of us to do any of this. But He gives us the opportunity to honor ourselves by standing up for the honor of Rasulullah. So may He allow us to understand this, this Ramadan. Amen. And to, you know, because the only way to understand that, that is to have his love and the love of his beloved, Salah and his family and his companions and all of those whom they love. Without that love, you know, there is no understanding of anything. So may he give us that love, you know, so that our eyes open up and we see things clearly. So, inshallah, we'll end here. Uh, those who have not made sunnah, go and make sunnah. Brothers already called the Adan.